Well, welcome, Meg. I'm so excited for our conversation today. I know we are going to dive in and talk all about headaches and migraines. So ladies, this is going to be a great episode because I know there are, I don't know if I say lots or several of you out there that uh, deal with headaches and migraines. So we're going to dive deep into this. So welcome, Meg. And thank you for having me. So let's start off with, I haven't had you on the podcast yet. And so I want everyone to just get to learn a little bit more about you and understand why you're so passionate about helping others to get rid of their headaches and their migraines, which I know can be so debilitating. Yes. Yeah, sure. So I um, w- started in the conventional side of medicine. I'm, I graduated with a PharmD and then I did a residency in ambulatory care. So I was working in a lot of hospital clinics and different settings. And, and I was really seeing people th- really survive more than thrive. You know, I knew the protocols. I knew why we were putting them on medications, but I th- felt like there was this huge gap in care where you're really just saying like, okay, go on this medication. Okay. The medication's the answer. And we're, we have this huge place where so many lifestyle things could change. We could really replete the right nutrients. We could do all these things. So we really don't even have to take the medications. And that was just not being really addressed. So that's really what made me along with some of my own personal health issues go that I was going through and not getting answers for myself. Think, okay, you know what, this is not, this is just, just another way that it's better that I, that I really feel like I'm more aligned with that. I believe while well, medication has a purpose at points, you know, for life-saving reasons, it's just not the go-to answer for everything all the time. And it, it's used that way, unfortunately. And so that's when I changed, I went back to get more education and I did certifications in functional medicine and I opened my own functional medicine practice. So I have a virtual functional medicine practice where I see people um, all over the world actually. And, and what I started to notice um, when I w- had, was working with people as I, w- I mostly see women, I have more uh, women in my practice than men. And I would have women coming to me either that they were suffering from regular headaches and migraines would be one thing, or they were actually coming to me for something totally different. But I do a very detailed intake questionnaire and symptom questionnaire when they start. And in that questionnaire, they would be answering oh, you know, I have headaches every week or regular headaches. I'm regularly having to take Advil or Tylenol or something, or just really normalizing it. And people started and would say like, oh, well, my mom has headaches. My sister has headaches. Just like we have, we have the headache gene, which we can get into. There's not really a headache (laughs) gene, but, um, (laughs) you know, it's just sort of different things that are in genetics that can make you more likely, but we can fix all of those. So then we'd work together and they would say like, I can't even believe it. Like my migraines are gone. I, you know, been suffering from years and there was these miraculous changes and so i really wanted to get the word out that you don't have to suffer you don't have to just take medication you don't have to live in pain there's so many things we can do and it's really about putting all those pieces together to really see this dramatic increase decrease sorry in um, both incidents and severity that's amazing so i know coming from the conventional to the functional medicine side. I know you've mentioned like, you know, medication has its own place. So what are some of the top things that you're, you're doing different on the functional side than you were doing on the more conventional side? Yeah. So when you think particularly about headache and migraine treatment, the conventional side is really looking to treat your pain. So they're actually just saying like, okay, what medication can we give you to decrease your pain so that you're not experiencing the pain when you have the headache? So it's really more of a pain management approach. Um, so when we're, but my goal, when we're looking at in functional medicine, we're looking at the root cause. So we're looking at why you're getting the headaches. We're not saying like, okay, let's put this bandaid on. So when you get the headache, you don't have pain, which is great. We need to do that. I can give you some tips on other ways to do that too, but we need to actually see why, why is your body having headaches? What, like what message, this is a message that you're getting. The pain is a message. So it's like, what is causing this message? So we need to actually 
like look at your body as a whole and really put all of the pieces together to really see what's going on in your unique situation that's actually creating the headaches. And that isn't all actually in your head. You know, it's not all in your brain. There are underlying gut issues. We can have hormonal imbalances. We can have foods that are causing it. We can have environmental things. So it's really taking all of those other pieces and connecting the dots where we really see this dramatic change. Is there, I know this is gonna be a loaded question and you may not be able to answer it, but is there kind of out of all of that that you said on the functional side, is there one area that you see tends to be more like the culprit for leading to headaches and migraines for women? Yeah, you know, it's it can it's different for each person. So I would say yeah. the th- there there are probably three buckets that I would say that I see the most common. So it's kind of like we think of it as peeling the onion back. Like, okay, where's this layer? Do we need how deep do we need to go to really get to where your core is that you are putting all have connected all of those dots? Um, you know, it, and, it, and it also can depend kind of on how your pattern is. So if you're someone who has a migraine, like the week before your period every month, or you have it during ovulation or while you're getting your period, then I commonly see that as a hormonal issue. So sometimes just really getting those hormones back in balance can make a huge difference there. If you're, if you say like, okay, you know what? I get them either like all the time or not necessarily in a pattern related to my cycle. Then I often see food triggers and food sensitivities along with underlying gut issues that can be big culprits there. So there's, while it's different for individual, like I would say those are some, some trends. Some of the top ones. So what about stress? Do you ever find that stress is a like standalone and trigger and that for is women. huge. Yeah. So that's, yeah. I guess, you know, no, it, it, that is huge too. So it's hard to say like, oh, it's just I know. those buckets. I know. But yes. Cause, yeah. cause stress is huge too. So I, I actually sometimes like refer to this as the chain of pain because, you know, when we're talking about stress in general, you're thinking about your to-do list. You're thinking about like, okay, I have stress. I have a lot going on. I'm stressed out, but stress is biological too. So we, if you have like you know, underlying gut inflammation, or if you're actually having pain, pain can be a stressor on the body in itself. So your pain that you're getting from your headache may be a stressor on your body, which can actually sometimes increase when your cortisol goes up, it can increase other hormones that actually can increase pain sensitivity. So sometimes then you're feeling more pain. So you get in this cycle of the pain can create the stress, can create the pain, and you have to actually break out of that cycle. So, you know, I do in, in my practice, I do a lot of testing. So I can, we can do cortisol testing. We can do hormone testing. We can do all of these to see where everything is and really like target that balance, but you can just start by actually working on your adrenal health and really taking, doing some daily practices that are just bringing your body back into that parasympathetic nervous system. So when we, we have two different nervous systems, we have a fight or flight, which is your sympathetic nervous system. And then we have a rest and digest, which is your parasympathetic our bodies are biologically intended to live in the parasympathetic nervous system. We're, you know, supposed to hang out there, you know, historically, like you're chased by a lion, you have to run, you jump into that, that sympathetic nervous system to really, you know, fight or flight. And then you're supposed to come back. But in our society, a lot of us are living in this sympathetic dominant state all the time. So we're basically, like fight or flight, fight or flight, and you're not really bringing yourself back. So you need to learn how to regulate your nervous system and really bring yourself back into that parasympathetic place, which we can actually do by something really simple, our breath. So you can actually take some time out of your day and do a a few minutes of breath work. I always say like practice it, do some deep breathing exercises when you're not stressed so that you're, you're training your body, how to feel relaxed, how to actually get that relaxation response, get that back into that parasympathetic nervous system. So that when you're stressed, you already have that, you're almost like muscle memory, um, where you're training your body to really be able to relax. Yeah. I love that advice. Breath is so important. It comes up all the time in conversations as does stress, right? Stress Mm -hmm. is 
so problematic and such a root uh, root cause for so many um, ailments in the body. Yeah. So I, I knew you mentioned adrenal health and this is another one. And again, of course I know stress is involved, but what are some other things that you recommend for women that, you know, and I know I want, I, want, I would like you to talk about exercise too in that mm -hmm. from, you know, because we talked a little bit when I was on your, your uh, show about exercise a little bit. So can you talk about how exercise could benefit and also hinder adrenal health with the stress response? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And you know, one other thing I just want to mention when it comes to that too, is a lot of the relaxation response or the stress response, the cortisol can be from perceived stress too. So I think mm -hmm. it, it is interesting because it's also about how you you're perce perceiving our body's going to respond to that. So it, it actually working on some of that, like, you know, thought reframing and stuff can go a long way too. But then the, yes, yeah. well, let's dive into the exercise. So what happens is when you're in this fight or flight for a long period of time. So, so you get, when you're starting to feel stressed and you're in fight or flight, you're in the sympathetic dominant nervous system, your cortisol is originally going to go up. So you're going to get this increase of cortisol. And so I'm going to describe that feeling as a, sort of feeling tired and wired at the same time. We generally feel like, oh, I'm always going, but I'm tired, but I feel like kind of hyped up because your cortisol's levels are high you want to go. Um, and then after a while of being in this place for a long time, your cortisol actually drops and you become, uh, we call that like adrenal fatigue is sort of the name that's become familiar for that term. And so you actually have low output of cortisol. Well, when this happens, you're going to start to feel exhausted all the time. That's more like, oh, I'm just tired. That actually might be a place where when you work out is the only time of the day that you actually feel that great because you're kicking into adrenaline and you're getting that adrenaline rush and then you're losing it. And then you're like, okay, I'm back to being tired. When we kind of get to this place, actually working out too hard can be a problem for us because working out actually is creating stress on the body, but you don't have that result, which can you know, sometimes that that can create resilience and we want some of that, you know, targeted stress to create that resilience. But when you're already in the low cortisol state, it actually can be too much for your body. So we're actually pulling exercise back at that point because we want to do, you know, when you're there. So if you're someone who is feeling like, oh, I'm just exhausted all the time and you're working out really hard, you're doing some HIIT workouts or, you know, things that are really, you know, long runs or things that are really kind of higher stress on the body, you may want to try to pull those back, do more light to moderate exercise. And that can actually be really more what your body needs right now. Thank you for sharing all of that, Meg. I, I appreciate that. I feel like I, I preach that a lot, but it's also, it's so good to have you explain it as well. Um, as I know I mentioned this to you before, the amount of women that I've helped over the years to actually pull back their exercise because it, it's hard, right? Because you mentioned like you get that you get that adrenaline kick. And so you think, oh well, my exercise is the only thing that makes me feel good, but it's actually dipping into your reserves even more and making you even more depleted. So we have to like it's a mental shift we have to work on at being like, okay, what can we, what movement can we do that is nourishing to our body that makes us feel good? And, and I, I like to talk about movement from a nourishing perspective because we don't think about movement. How can mm -hmm. movement be nourishing? Yeah. And I love that, like getting women to like shift that perspective of their movement practice. So ladies, if you're tired all the time, all the time, mm -hmm. you may be dealing with headaches or migraines from time to time. And, you, but, but you still are doing that high intensity exercise sometimes and it, you get a little lift, but then you like crash later. That's too much. You've got to pull it back and again, move. I'm the first person to say, tell you like, you've got to move, but we got to do the mm -hmm. right type of movement for your body. So we're not depleting us more, or we're just, it's just a vicious cycle and it can be really hard to get out of it. And yeah, I think it's hard because I think people are hearing so much information these days. So it's like, you have to do this, you have to do this, you have to do this. And then, but you know what, that's not for everyone. So we're just all 
unique and where we are like and that might be right for you right now and it might be different a month from now or a year from now but you really need to listen to your body and where you are right now and what your body needs and and respect that because you know really you could be hurting yourself more by pushing through to do those things and just kind of giving yourself a break and some grace to really just relax a little bit and do things that are movement in a, like I said, low intensity way. I, I was working recently with someone who was doing CrossFit and she was having this adrenal fatigue and we were, and it, it was a big change for her in that and trying to really work deep into what exercise she, she can do that are nourishing versus what she had been doing. But once she actually made those changes, it's like you start to see that those results and see that healing that you've been looking for for a long time. Yeah. And it doesn't mean, this is the other piece I want to reiterate to everyone listening. It doesn't mean you can't ever do that high intensity yeah. or those CrossFit or long runs or whatever. Again, it, it, we get so in this like all or none kind of mentality. Mm -hmm. It's like, it's a right, it's a just for right now, kind of, we have to have more of that lighthearted mentality about it because otherwise it's, even that much harder for you. It's like, no, I know Megan, I would like all of you to be able to do, if you want to do the higher intensity stuff and the longer runs, great, that's awesome. But maybe we got to take a pause on them and shift gears for a while so that we can work to heal our bodies and so that we can feel better. And then we can gradually work back into them down the road and you'll feel way better down the road and you'll be, be stronger and all of that. When you take that little bit of time you know, now to do what you need to do to heal your body, renourish your body, whatever it is that, that your body needs right now. So thank you for all that, Meg. Yes. So, okay. Yeah. So many more things we got to, I know we are like, we got to keep going. Otherwise we'll talk about exercise the whole time, the whole time. So, <laughs> <laughs> cause I love it. Um, okay. So, and I know again, this, some of these questions I know are hard to answer because it's, it can be very individual. So I, I totally mm -hmm. get that, but from a kind of general overview, are there certain foods that you recognize are triggers? And again, I know it can be different, but are yeah. there kind of like some common ones that you're like, these, these really are ones I am seeing kind of repeated through a lot of my clients that have headaches or migraines. Yeah. Um, I love this question. Yeah. yeah Cause okay. this is great. So when we're looking at like food is complicated, I'm going to, that's the first thing I'm going to say when it comes to headaches, cause it, it there, it's all about threshold. Um, so when you're looking that we know, like from the data statistically, there are certain food groups that are more likely to trigger headaches. So we have foods with histamine, con histamine containing foods, tyramine containing foods. So histamine containing foods would be like aged cheese, fermented foods. Those are some example. We have tyramine, tyramine containing foods, which are like cured foods. And some of those aged foods, we have um, salicylates, which are uh, citrus foods. So actually like lemons are, can be a surprising one. Nitrates that are like hot dogs and things like that you have aspartame, which is in diet sodas, we have MSG, um, and even caffeine can create headaches for some people and actually relieve some sometimes headaches because of the vasodilation constriction. But it, if you have too much caffeine you'll, you, and then stop it, you get rebound headaches. So we have all of these buckets of food, but what's tricky is that not all of those foods are going to cause headaches for all people. And sometimes it's about the threshold of food. So for example, like sometimes you can eat a little bit of that food and not have the headache or the migraine ha happen, but then the next time you ate it, maybe in a different portion or in a combination with something else, it's the, it's enough to trigger you. So that's why, like, I'm going to use wine, for example, a lot of people will say, well, I don't, I'm confused because sometimes I could have a glass of wine. Wine has histamine. It has tyramine. It, you can sometimes have that and I'm, and I'm okay, but then I could have a glass and that brings on a migraine, but that might, maybe you had more, maybe you have that with some aged cheese. Maybe there, there was something that just put you over that edge. So we have to really start to become detectives here. I feel like this is where you have to start to look at patterns. So one of the things that I'll have people do is actually take a blank calendar of like a month 
And then right when you have a headache, I have them write down for about 48 hours before that, because sometimes food reactions are delayed, mm -hmm. what food you ate. So if you look at all the, the food you've eaten in the 48 hours before, and then start to look at patterns, are there any trends? Is it like, you know, and it's actually amazing sometimes what people find like, oh, you every actually I ate lemons every time or I, I ate olives or there can be these connections where you can start to see this pattern of food that you never even realize might be mm -hmm. in the foods that were actually triggering you. So it it's really enlightening. The others then there's like a whole nother bucket here. And that are those are individual food sensitivities. So food sensitivities are IgG antibodies. And these are foods that are really we have um, really when you think of your gut lining we can get like tears in the gut lining which is called intestinal permeability or often people hear of it as leaky gut and when that starts to happen we can get some particles that were bigger than intended kind of in the bloodstream and we start to get these antibodies to food so when we do food sensitivity testing and pull some of those foods out too that your body has these IgG antibodies then we can see a huge difference in the headaches there too. So it's like that sort of more individualized and will be different for everyone mm -hmm. uh, where we look at these other food groups that I mentioned that sort of have these common patterns that we see over and over again with people with migraines and headaches. Yeah, so everyone listening that gets headaches and migraines start tracking. That's a good, yes. easy place to start and see if you don't, uh, see if you don't notice a pattern they could help to at least start to mitigate them. And then, yeah, I'm a huge fan of testing too. Sometimes mm -hmm. you just got to test to figure out what's, what's going on, what your body's reacting to. So, yeah. Um, okay. Anything else about food you want to talk about? Otherwise I want to move yeah, on to hormones. Just, <laughs> yeah, no, that, that is, that, I think just like really starting to become in tune with one, know that foods can trigger. So the, your, what you're eating is affecting. So I think that that's like also maybe not taught well that actually food can play a role, like food might have something to do with this and then really starting to look for patterns. And then if you really want to get dive into your unique ones, then, then do the testing. Yeah. Love it. Okay. Let's talk about hormones. Cause I know women who are like, you know, they can totally tell their headaches or migraines are ho hormonal driven. I think this is quite common. I, I feel like it's quite common. Would you agree mm -hmm. in what you see? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I see it all the time. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so when it comes to hormones, like, you know, what, what do you tell women when you're seeing that it's cyclical? Are there certain things that you can say, Hey, if it's, if you're noticing you're getting, you know, your headaches or migraines, you know, five, seven days before like, here's some things you might want to be kind of testing or looking for. What about like when they start, like I have women that say, gosh, like I get a headache. I, I know my period starting today because I get a headache or I get a migraine right before it starts. Like, are those two different situations? Like, can you just explain to me, like, what, what could be going on from a hormonal perspective that's causing the headaches and migraines? Yes. So the most, the, the hormone that we're looking at when we're looking at hormonal migraines is estrogen. So we want to look, you know, we're looking at a rapid change in estrogen, which can happen that often um, when you ovulate, you get the high, uh, the estrogen goes up and it goes down to, for ovulation. So that some people that get that like ovulatory headache can be from like a rapid change. We also want to look at estrogen in relation to progesterone. So we, and then even sometimes really low levels of estrogen too. So it's, it's like the estrogen dominance I see a lot, but also you can get a drop in estrogen that can cause it. So what happens the week before your period is that's like your estrogen and your progesterone are both declining, but you'll, you're, if you don't have enough progesterone or if your progesterone's like declining fast or lower than estrogen, you have estrogen dominance. And then that's when often people are getting these hormonal migraines. So we need to look at your estrogen levels, your estrogen metabolism, and all of the things surrounding that. So when we look at estrogen, there's a lot of different factors. So one, 
And it's very important to look at how your estrogen is in relation to your progesterone. So you can be, you can actually sometimes have like, you know, if you got your estradiol level taken in your blood work, you could have a fine estradiol. It could look like it's normal, but where is your progesterone in comparison to that? So we need to look like, is it a progesterone deficiency? Is it an estrogen excess? And then you also have to look at how you're metabolizing it, the estrogen. So we have three phases of metabolism when it comes to estrogen. Two of them are in the liver and then one is in the gut. So we wanna look at our liver health, our gut health, and really see how we're metabolizing our estrogen. I see actually commonly we have these metabolites. You want your estrogen to go down certain pathways. You wanna say like use it and then lose it. And sometimes I actually see on the lower end of estrogen, but you're actually shunning it down the wrong pathway. So we're getting these really high estrogen metabolites that are causing all of these estrogen dominant symptoms. What can be confusing there is if you just got your blood work again, like with that estradiol level, it doesn't look high, but because you have these high metabolites, you're still getting estrogen dominant symptoms. So it, it's tr it is tricky. I do, I do recommend testing for this if you really think it is something you have, because when we test, we can just look at all of this so clearly and say like, okay, this is how we balance it all. And then we can, we can really get it back into alignment. Um, but there is, you know, there are things you can do right now. So we're going to look at, you know, actually eliminating endocrine disruptors. So we want to look at things that are in your personal, um, like personal care products. We want to look at things like BPA, which is in plastics. That's a big one because we're actually putting our food often in plastic containers. And then we're putting those either in the microwave or the dishwasher. Well, when we heat the plastic, it actually degrades and then it can leach into your food. So then you're eating food that has the BPA in it. And, you know, so it's even more so because of that degradation. So just even doing something simple, like switching your plastic containers to glass containers and storing your food in glass rather than plastic when you're finishing your next product, look at the product and then you can go to um, apps like Think Dirty, you can go to ewg.org skin deep, you can, you know, there's so many places you can now scan the products. It makes it so much easier because when you're looking at these, I mean, I could like list off on this podcast, a list of endocrine disruptors, but they're not, they're going to be like, oh, I don't understand yeah. that the, all those words, they're chemicals. So, yeah. you know, if you, if you get an app and you scan it and you're like, okay, you know what, I'm going to look and make sure that I have like clean ingredients in my products and it can be expensive. So, you know, sometimes even just taking when you're done with one, you know, one at a time, just start replacing some of these because when we're actually using a lot of these, this is increasing our overall estrogen load. So what we want to do is bring that down. We also want to look at like our meat and our, and our dairy are, you know, are they being fed the animals that we're eating? Are they being fed hormones? So, you know, really paying attention to some of that and just bringing your overall hormone levels down can be a big step in the right direction. Yeah, absolutely. So I want to talk a little bit more about, um, methylation of hormones and the yes. pathways. I assume you're running Dutch tests is what it sounds yes, like. Yes, I am running Dutch tests. Yes. Yeah, we talked mm -hmm. about the Dutch test, which I always recommend women doing the Dutch test. I think mm -hmm. it can be very, very informative because I think this is where women get confused, right? You were mentioning like testing your estrogen and progesterone levels. Like if you go do a blood test at your doctors and they come back quote normal and you're like, okay, well, my labs are normal, but I feel like crap. Like what, mm -hmm. you know, maybe you've Googled and it's like, well, I'm seeming to have estrogen dominance and so my estrogen levels are normal. Again, like, so that's very confusing. We have to go into this looking to see how we're, how we're metabolizing our, our hormones. Um, and is there anything else you can add to that for women to understand and like the balance of it? Cause I think, I know we've talked about it before, but I think it's super important to like hit on that from also mm -hmm. a preventative for future health as well for women to make sure that we are metabolizing, um, hormones correctly. Yes. Okay. So yes. So you have, um, you know, you want to have estrogen and progesterone balanced with each other, but your estrogen, your estradiol is going to, so like I said, we want to use our estradiol. So use it and then lose it. So you don't want that hanging around in your body, which if your metabolism is off, it can. So 
one of the most common patterns we, you know, it's it, when I'm talking, it's like, oh, the CYP3A4 versus the CYP1A1 pathway. Yeah. Like, there are different pathways it can go down, but we sometimes see some of these pathways that we don't want it to go down upregulated and the place that we do want it to go down, downregulated. So that's when we have to do things to shift that balance. And that's something I do see commonly happen with people who are actually chronic migraine sufferers that their pathways need to be shifted. So, you know, even something simple like eating cruciferous vegetables, you know, sometimes we do supplements, we have to actually do more intense things to really get you in set up in the right place. But adding cruciferous vegetables can actually help you go metabolize your estrogen down the correct pathway. So we want to maybe add some broccoli, cauliflower, Brussels sprouts, you know, things like that into your diet and see if that's helping you. So then that's phase one metabolism. And then you're talking about methylation, that's phase two metabolism. So we're looking at like B vitamins, magnesium, choline, coins and eggs. So even sometimes eating an egg a day, like th those are also things that can, if, you know, if eggs are something that serve you, I know that everybody has different dietary restrictions, but you know, that's a way to increase your choline um, to make sure that we're really getting it down, you know, the second pass metabolism and then really focusing on your gut health because estrogen is going to bind to bile and so and then that it's excreted so we had you and i had talked when you were on my podcast about uh i mean when i yes when you're on my podcast <laughs> about um about i'm like now i'm getting confused so about like, like constipation and how whenever you're constipated you're not actually excreting things the well and how that's affecting the pelvic floor but in this case then it actually can promote estrogen reabsorption so if you're, if you have some high beta glucuronidase, I have a whole podcast episode actually on the estrobilome. So the estrobilome is the name of all of the bacteria that can actually affect uh, estrogen metabolism in the gut. So that's another one to like to listen to about all like it's a whole podcast on this dynamic, but it actually can cleave the estrogen from the bile and then it can actually be reabsorbed in the system. Again, if you're constipated, it, it prom can promote that too. So then you're actually never really getting rid of the estrogen that you, your body's making and then that can also cause some of these symptoms. So it's really understanding all of the dynamics instead of just looking at that one snapshot blood level. Yeah, I appreciate does you sharing more your about question? that. Yeah, it does. Because I wanted you to just go a little deeper for everybody listening. Because I think that this, well, even if, you know, it, it can sound kind of confusing, it, I think it's so important to understand and educate that it's not just like this one thing or this one thing. And then you also mentioned bile. I just want to talk about this a little bit more because, you know, having enough bile is so important. And if we have a sluggish liver with, because we're, our body's kind of jammed up, like you said, with some toxin load from products, exposure, whatever it might be. Um, so what are some things you recommend to help women make sure you know, they, their liver is not so congested or their, their body's creating enough bile, things like that. Yeah. You know, so it, it depends. I, I would actually just start with whole, you know, start with whole foods and cleansing foods. You know, there's so many, we could go deep into those so many, <laughs> I, like I know. detoxing <laughs> protocols and we can move, but you know, you don't want to, I don't want to recommend any of that until so you have so this is the thing about detoxing you have to have everything firing at all cylinders before you want to actually go into a deep cleanse because if you if you move toxins and you don't have like you are constipated or something you don't have any place for them to go where are they going to go they're just going to circulate again so we want to it, it's really that stepwise process of really healing all of the different places in the right order but you know really just even take out let's start with the basics take out processed foods you know add whole nutrient dense foods you can add like even things like cilantro is a good um artichoke can be good for your liver different things things that are that are good supporting foods for liver health that are in, in cleansing to your diet. So you're and you're eating whole foods, vegetables, fruits, phytonutrients, getting all of those things while eliminating the processed foods, the high sugar foods are, are all just important places to start. No, I appreciate you saying that. I get really passionate about detoxing, but 
you said it so well that it's like, we can't just dive in and detox. Cause when I hear people say, Oh, I did a liver cleanse. I'm like, yeah, no, that's not like you, if, if you, if you don't have everything working hand in hand, that could actually backfire on you and make you feel very unwell. So Meg, I appreciate everything you're saying, all the work you're doing. Um, so yeah. <laughs> Was there something you wanted yeah, to add? Yeah, and I to think that? it's like, you know, people are hearing it. Like people are hearing detox, yeah. detox, detox. So mm -hmm. you're starting. So that's a common thing to start these detoxes. But it's like, okay, but well, where are you right now in your health in order to get the most benefit? It's a great thing to do at the right time, but just not for everyone yeah. where you are right now. Yeah, absolutely. I love it. Okay, Meg, is there anything else that uh, we haven't hit on that you wanted to make sure you share with everyone when it comes to, you know, having the right information, um, when it comes to working on getting rid of headaches and migraines. You know, one simple thing people can start to do is just hydrate because dehydration mm -hmm. is actually an independent risk factor for headaches. And I think like, you know, really looking, are you staying hydrated? Are you staying hydrated at a cellular level? Are you sipping your water all throughout the day? Do you keep a water bottle beside you? You know, just really focusing there because it's like, we want to go to these big things. You know, I, I love the testing. That's my jam. I like, I love figuring all of that out, but you can start with basics too. And if you're dehydrated or you're not sleeping, well, those can also be factors. So don't skip over the basics too. And just making sure that you're doing, you know, getting a good night's sleep, and staying hydrated. Those basics are also important. Yes, very important. So well said. Are you a fan of electrolytes for staying hydrated? Because I know so many women, they say like, oh my gosh, I drink, I drink so much water and I still feel dehydrated. So what are your thoughts on electrolytes? Yes. And like, I, yeah, I mentioned the cellular level. So I, I do like electrolytes because we do want to make sure that we're getting that cellular hydration, particularly with, with headaches. And so adding some electrolytes can be a good, a good way. Also drinking, like when you're drinking, drink throughout the day. So often a lot of us get really thirsty and we'll chug water and then we'll, and then that can just go right through us because you're getting it all at the same time. But if you actually spread it out and make sure you're sipping all through the day, kind of take that away from meals because drinking a lot at meals can affect the digestion and just think about having <laughs> the hydrate <laughs> constant hydration. Then that, I think that goes, is a lot, uh, goes farther in actually adding some electrolytes can be good. Awesome. I love it. Well, Meg, this has been so incredible. Thank you for all of this incredible information. Um, can you share with everybody where they can reach out to you, find out more about you and, uh, or more about what you're, what you do. And then I also know you have an eight step guide to saying goodbye to yes. headaches naturally. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. Yeah. So I have an eight step guide to say goodbye to headaches and that's just at helpmyheadaches.com. So you can get that. That's a great place to get started. I also have a free training that's about an hour long and you you can go to head or that one is headache freedom it's just www.headachefreedom.com so if you want if you have headaches you're like i want to learn more those are two places um to go to get more information my website is just megmill.com and um that's just m-e-g-m-i-l-l.com and i also have a podcast called a little bit healthier where we talk about all ways to add <laughs> health into your lives every day. And I'm over on Instagram at Dr. Meg Mills, just DR Meg Mills. So if you want to learn more or follow along, I'd, I'd be, I'd love the community. I love being on and sharing and educating. Well, I love this Meg. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me.